So uh, what I'm going to take you guys through is our network CI pipeline um, solution that we've been developing here. And I'm going to start off just kind of taking a big picture view of this network operations model. So as we've seen customers progress in their maturity when it comes to how they deal with network operations, we see them move from this kind of far left where it takes you years to make changes to your network to the far right where people can actually just make changes uh, you know, day, daily or hourly if they really wanted to. And uh, this is a very kind of long, slow process for many enterprises, uh, and we acknowledge that. But you know, the things that we see are common are people moving from you know, snowflake designs and anti-patterns when it comes to their networks to repeatable cookie cutters when it comes to network deployment. So it's really hard to automate things until you get things well-defined and, and repeatable. Uh, as you move further to the right, you start introducing things like read-only automation and telemetry and monitoring. So here's where things like Cloud Vision make a big impact where I can start getting real-time telemetry as to what the current status is of my network. I wanna know what I'm doing. I wanna be able to measure what's happening before I make these changes. And I think a lot of the stuff here is where we start to get network operators comfortable with the tooling and the ideas around DevOps and uh, infrastructure as code and all of these kind of whiz bang terms that get thrown around. And there's just kind of an onboarding process, I feel. Now, once we move into the system automation category, I think this is where things start to really get interesting. So we're gonna actually start to automate our workflows. And a big piece here that I think has been missing when it comes to network automation in the past has been how do we test these things? As Doug mentioned, we've had config rollback, we've had ways of undoing changes once they hit the network. But what I really wanna do is have the best level of assurance I can that the changes I'm gonna make uh, aren't gonna break the network, um, if at all possible, before I actually touch the live production uh, network. Some other cool things that we've started to see pop up are using sources of truth. Uh, so some form of database like a NetBox or an Autobot, uh, integrating these tools with a CI pipeline. So you'll see some of this in the demo that I'll show you in a little bit. And you know, going to the far right, again, it's kind of throwing in that AI term, but once you've got all this other stuff in place, it starts to lend itself to being able to do really interesting things when it comes to what do I do with all this data that I've gathered and all this automation that I've put in. So some goals that we've set here as what we wanna accomplish with our network CI or network continuous integration. Um, this top left one is infrastructure as code. So a lot of the principles we're introducing here aren't new, they're actually been used in software development for ages. Uh, we're just trying to apply that to infrastructure and networking. So treating your network configuration and your changes as a piece of software kind of introduces this whole concept. Having a source of truth to kind of be where I'm gonna derive my configurations from uh, really makes things a lot more solid, a lot more um, rational when it comes to what I'm gonna do with my automation. And I think one thing that I've seen a lot of folks get hung up on is they think there has to be one authoritative source of truth for everything. But I feel like really what you need is a source of truth for the piece of data you're going after. So, you know, maybe that's GitHub for my configs uh, that I've generated. Maybe that's an Autobot for my IPAM or something like that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be this one massive database end all be all, but you could actually have a source of truth depending on what the type of data you're going after. Uh, the system testing that we mentioned earlier. So how do I introduce these tests and how do I make them repeatable? How do I codify the things that I wanna make sure work whenever I make a network change? So that if I make a new change, I don't have to sit here and guess whether or not this is gonna break something I fixed earlier. Um, I can kind of have these repeatable tests that get automatically run. And then establishing those patterns. So how do I scale this out to, to larger networks? So I think one of the big problems we've had in the past and, and Doug kind of hinted at this, is just the amount of choice out there, right? If you go there and you Google for network automation, you'll get a thousand tools hit and you'll just get overwhelmed with the amount of choices and options and combinations you can do uh, when it comes to what do I do for network automation? And I think this is where a lot of our customers have gotten stuck. And what we wanted to do is take this kind of field of choices out there and narrow it down to a reference architecture where we can identify a set of tools that you know, we're familiar with We've seen a lot of customers have success with, we've had success with, with and be able to present that to our customers as a, uh, as a reference, which we can then build upon. So by no, mean, by no means are these tools carved in stone, right? You can easily swap out, say GitLab here in this picture for GitHub or for Jira or something like that, or you wanna swap out Ansible for Salt or, or whatever tool you might wanna use. But the kind of the point is to get the conversation going to kind of unfreeze people from that kind of serial aisle full of choices 
and allow them to kind of get the ball rolling. So for those folks who haven't been able to get going, this is this is the first step. So you'll see the far the, the processes are going to pretty much stay the same no matter what tool you're using. So far far left, we're seeing you can want to author and develop and you know make your changes. Uh, we've seen VS Code is an awesome tool for that. A lot of people love the IDE environment or the code editor environment of VS Code. Uh, and it's something we're actively trying to develop some additional plugins and things for to make your life easier if you're using something like a VS Code and you're kind of following this, this blueprint. GitLab is one choice when it comes to um, code repository as well as a CI engine. One of the reasons we chose this here is because it can act as both my code repository and my CI uh, engine. So I don't have to deploy two different pieces of software to handle those things as well as it offers a nice on-prem and cloud-based model. So if you want to run this all on-prem, you can. If you want to run it all in the cloud, you can do that too. Uh, but you know, this is a really important piece is to have this both code repository version control of my configs, as well as something to drive my CI pipeline. Then we move into this pre-deployment testing. And I think you know, some of you out there are familiar with Batfish. Uh, for some folks, it'll probably be new, but it's a really interesting and awesome tool when it comes to how can I validate these network changes before they get rolled out. So the neat thing that Batfish does is it actually takes all of my config files. It models out what your network behaviors are going to be and allows you to run queries against it. So without having to spin up VMs, without having to spin up a bunch of containers or a simulated network, it actually just models out the behavior of that network. And then I can say, well, do these ACLs do what I expect them to do? Do my routing tables look the way I expect them to do or expect them to look after I make this network change? And so you'll see that part of this pipeline. This is, I think, really a key component as to how this whole thing comes together. When it comes to re release and deployment, uh, Ansible, I think, is kind of the king here when it comes to, to network folks and how we do network automation. And you'll see Cloud Vision here is something that we see works well with Ansible. So our goal here is not to say, you know, you have to choose either use Ansible to do your deployments or use Cloud Vision to use your deployments. We actually have a really awesome Ansible CVP module, which you'll see, uh, which allows Ansible to drive Cloud Vision. So one thing that I've kind of missed here is that all the tools you'll see up to this point have been open source tools, have been multi-vendor tools, have been tools that I can use to configure some other networking gear or even other gear in my data center in general, uh, as well as my Arista stuff. And what we wanna do is try to provide you with the best experience when you're using these tools with Arista Kit, right? So if I'm using Ansible with Cloud Vision with EOS or using Batfish in conjunction with Arista tools, we wanna give you the best possible experience there. But we're not trying to lock you in to say, you have to use you know, Arista tooling all the way soup to nuts. We actually wanna kind of keep things open uh, and multi-vendor as much as possible. Then when we go to the far right, here's where we're gonna do our network observability, DMF to do packet level monitoring, Cloud Vision to do telemetry. And you know, we could also export this to Prometheus. We could send it to Elk Stack or, or Grafana, whatever you wanna use there. And then kind of underpinning on the bottom here is a foundational piece. We have that source of truth. And this could be Nautobot, which you'll see what we're, we're gonna use here um, when it comes to some of the inventory and some of the IP address management and stuff. And then Cloud Vision when it comes to the real time state of the network. I mean, that's really where Cloud Vision shines is it has that real time state streaming uh, ability to suck in all the data from the switches and knows exactly what the current state of the network is. So again, two different sources of truth depending on which piece of information I'm going after. All right, so let's let's go ahead and pop into the demo here. So I'm gonna start off here with uh, Nautobot. So for those who aren't familiar with Nautobot, it's you know, a, a tool that you can use to manage your inventory. I can set up where my racks are, what equipment's racked where, what's wired into what, as well as it also can act as an IPAM or IP address management system. Now, what we're gonna do here in this demo is we're going to use Nautobot as an IPAM. And so it's the source of truth when it comes to my IP addresses. And what I can do is I can tag certain IP addresses as being critical. So these could be my NTP servers, they could be my DNS servers, things that I think should always be reachable from everywhere on the network. And what we've done here is based on these critical IP addresses, whenever these change, we actually are triggering a webhook that updates this JSON file sitting here in my repository. So anytime somebody adds or removes a new critical IP address, we go ahead and update this file, which then I'm gonna use later on when it comes to how do we actually test that my configuration changes aren't breaking anything. So we never had to manually do anything there. We actually just automatically update that list. So now what I wanna do is make this change to the network. And you'll see we're gonna use VS Code, we're gonna use Ansible to make these changes. 
these Ansible changes are within the framework of uh, an Ansible collection we have called Arista AVD or Arista Validated Designs. And essentially what AVD does is takes our best practices when it comes to network design, codifies that and gives you an abstraction, abstraction layer when it comes to configuring your devices. I don't have to go doing individual device configs. I can do fabric wide configs. So here you'll see we're actually just modifying the ACLs for all of my leaf switches, all my layer three leaves. Uh, so I don't have to go touching every single individual device. And so for the sake of the demo, we're going to go ahead, we're going to check out a new branch. So we're following that kind of CI uh, software development process. We're going to set this new branch to be NFD. And then I'm going to uncomment this line of ACL here. So you'll see this line number five uh, is actually going to block access to one of the IP addresses that I had earlier deemed as critical. And now that I've made this change, I'm going to commit this code to my laptop. So we changed our ACL, and then we're going to push this up to the repository. So once I did that git push, it's going to fire off the CI pipeline. We're also working with Slack here. So you can see that you know I get a Slack notification telling me, hey, you've pushed up a new change, and lets the rest of the team know uh, that we've pushed up a change as well. So I think a big part of this is also inter-team communication, right? Because we have a whole cultural aspect of, of DevOps and CI that we need to work through. And so when I come over here to the CI pipeline, you can see now it's running through the build process. So the first thing it's doing is taking those templates that I showed you earlier, it's rendering out the rest of the configuration. So the output of this is actually just a bunch of CLI, a bunch of config files that we can then run through the next phase of the, uh, the pipeline. So once the building phase is done, and that's using again, Ansible and our AVD process to actually render out the configs, it's gonna run through the testing phase. So here's where Batfish comes in. And I have some Batfish scripts that are actually taking those configs and it's going to validate that those critical ACLs are reachable. And you can see that that failed. We can see back over here in Slack that I got a notification saying, hey, you failed that stage. So everybody on the team knows that I messed up. And if I click here on the actual the detail of that stage, I can see, well, traffic was unable to reach one of my IP addresses. So this is why it failed. So let's go back through and let's go correct my mistake. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to I'm just going to recomment uh, this line again. So we're going to take line number five. We'll comment that, we'll commit it, and we'll push it up again. So again, just following that same cycle through uh, as we go through and, and kind of work through the CI pipeline. So we push it again. Again, I get a notification in Slack. Everybody knows that we're pushing up new changes, and we'll roll through the pipeline one more time. So this time through, you know, I've I've allowed traffic to to still flow to the to the endpoints that are supposed to be reachable, and we should kind of get through this. Once we've completed this part, so once we got green check marks across the board on our validation phase, what we'll then be able to do is do a merge request. So we're going to start following, you know, how do I take these changes that I've made locally to my branch and how do I push these into kind of the main configuration branch? So we've got our green check marks here and now we're ready to go ahead and do our merge. Oh, and by the way, we're just validating that we've got the, uh, the, past, the past test there. Uh, so we go to our branch, we set up our merge request, and what this will do is also allow us to put in an approval flow, right? So now I can say, I want to have, you know, three people approve any changes that I'm making. Um, I want to have, you know, a certain level of authority approve things before I actually make these changes out to the network. Uh, so this kind of gives you that check and balance, and it gives them the ability as reviewers to go through, see what the output was of the tests, make sure all the tests pass, they can do diffs on whatever changes are being made, uh, and then we can submit the merge. Once we submit that merge, it's gonna roll through that testing phase one more time just to make sure everything is, is absolutely good before we're able to do any kind of deployment. So we're just rolling through that process one more time, but the beauty is this is all automated, right? So I don't have to go do this manually every time I'm making any changes. This is all just happening um, through the pipeline. Now, another neat thing that AVD does as part of this build process is not only does it generate the actual CLI configs, so you'll see that, you know, I'll show you in a second here, it's going to generate the CLI output, but it's also going to generate, auto-generate um, documentation. So now we finish the build phase here. If I go over here to the separate repo, here's where it's auto-generated a bunch of markdown docs that's kind of documenting what's going on on my network right now. So as we all know as network guys, it's really hard to keep our docs up to date. Almost no one really keeps them up to date as much as they should. Uh, and so here's a way to kind of alleviate that problem a bit. So here you've got these nice markdown files that document everything that's going on in the network. And in addition, you know, as we said, part of that AVD build process is it auto generates the, the, the uh, actual rendered CLI. So if I go over here to my, 
configurations, we can actually see the full CLI that's about to be pushed out to these devices. So this is the actual CLI output. So, uh, and we can run diffs on this. And again, this is version controlled now. So if I need to go back and look what the configs look like in, in the past, I can. All right, so we're ready to move on to the last phase of our pipeline. And what that is, is actually deploying these configs. And so you'll see we have, first of all, we have a manual step here. So we have to hit the play button. A human actually has to go through and press that play button to actually deploy these. So, you know, just sticking in one level of operator assurance in there. Um, and there's actually two paths there. And I'll, I'll kind of explore that in a little bit. But uh, what I'm quickly showing you there, I kind of flashed up on the screen was, we didn't have any config with starting with, starting with the word demo. And that's the word, those are the ones we're gonna push out now. And so this deployment phase that I'm gonna do right now is actually gonna take Ansible and it's gonna push all those configs that I generated using Ansible, pushing them into Cloud Vision. So here's where Ansible and Cloud Vision are working together. Ansible taking all that configuration generation task and then um, building them all up and pushing them uh, into Cloud Vision itself. And the nice thing I think, you know, as you may have noticed so far, we've really highlighted the open source tools all the way along this chain, right? All the tools I've been using up to just about this point are tools that I could use um, no matter what network and uh, networking devices I'm using. So now if I come back to Cloud Vision and I refresh my configlet page, you can see we've got all those generated uh, demo configs there and they're all ready for deployment. So we've got all this stuff now pushed into Cloud Vision via Ansible and I can use the same workflow uh, for my other devices as well. Now the other path that I kind of mentioned earlier here is where is actually some things we're still kind of working on, right? So this, this is a different approach that we can take which is where we're gonna leverage this Cloud Vision Studios functionality. So this is where Cloud Vision would actually have the same data model that we're using to populate those uh, Ansible AVDs, but now expressed in Cloud Vision. So it's, it's able to validate configurations. It's able to use Batfish. It would be a more integrated piece of this pipeline uh, for those who wanna use Cloud Vision a little bit more extensively. So what happens here is I'm gonna uh, or I'm gonna exercise that other branch and I'm gonna say use uh, Cloud Vision Studios. And now if I come back over here to Cloud Vision Studio, you can see it's populating that same kind of ACL data, uh, but this time using Studios. And you can see we've also marked the uh, pipeline number. So if I go down here to this pipeline, that's the same pipeline number that was triggered from GitLab. So we're trying to integrate the workflow such that if I need to go back and trace my steps, I can say, okay, well, this pipeline is exactly what triggered this config change. And I've got, a, I've got breadcrumbs to take me back. And here you can see the same ACLs have been populated and generated, but now it's in a, in a model, more model-like format or a better data model when it comes to how Cloud Vision is able to understand and treat these configs. And the okay. other value I think we, can, we have here with Cloud Vision is that you know, as part of the config rollout process, what again, Cloud Vision is aware of is the current state of the network. So if you know, I'm trying to make a change, let's say to an MLAG pair, and that config change is gonna break something because of the current status of MLAG, or uh, I try to go into BGP maintenance mode and I'm not able to drain enough traffic off of the switch before I go into BGP maintenance mode as part of the config change window. Cloud Vision would be aware of that and be able to take action and say, hey, uh, well, this change isn't gonna be a good idea right now, push back and let you rerun this later on when maybe uh, things are in a better state. So that's kind of it for the first demo. And I'm gonna pop back over here to the slides. So one big piece of this that we talked about, oh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, I've got a quick question. This is Ed. Um, yeah. So in regards to the Batfish components and what you're doing on the validation and testing side, are, yeah. are you guys doing scenario-based testing too for things like, hey, I want to have my primary data center all be failed. So I want my route state condition to be that my primary site has failed and my secondary data center site is currently the hot site. Do you have things like that that you guys are building in or are you expecting customers to sort of build their use case scenarios around that to find that stuff within Batfish and then use that to be able to sort of walk through in their in their workflow for their for their pipeline about how they how they test certain use case conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's it's a little bit tough to do a one size fits all with a lot of that stuff because everybody's mm -hmm. data centers and failure conditions are a little different. Um, but what we are doing is building back into this AVD templating system that we've got with Ansible, the ability to auto generate a bunch of kind of, I would maybe call them, you know, layer one or layer two tests, layer three tests, simple tests that would that would let you get by. Yeah, break, break, break tests, right? Where you say like, yeah, yeah. This, this link is down, my WAN connectivity is lost, my, my BGP is neighbor beer is down, things like that, that are right. common use case scenarios. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's something we're, we're developing now as part of the ABD framework. It's not quite there yet, but it's something that we're adding in as we kind of fully develop this. Uh, but I do think that's a really cool use case that Batfish provides you those what if scenarios, right? What if this happens? What will happen through the network and how can I model that out? And how do I do that without actually incurring chaos into my network as part of that? Right. Process? Yeah. Because it sort of gives you the same behavior as running Chaos Monkey without necessarily having to destroy what you got going on within your network, which is which is exactly. nice. I mean, I, I, li I like the concept of killing services, but killing your network is a whole, whole different arrangement <laughs> versus killing services. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, so I'm just curious, because this is the first time I'm like hearing of Batfish. It's freaking amazing. And I'm just trying to figure out, so is this specific to Arista, or does this integrate with all other vendors like Cisco, Juniper? Yeah, so so it's an open source tool. They, they okay. work with most of the major network vendors, you know. Um, so, so again, one of the big things we've got throughout this pipeline, I, I know I've said it like a few times, but, you know, we're using a lot of open source tools that are multi-vendor friendly. So yeah, Batfish, and you know what's also cool is that I could use Batfish to model how do my how does my Arista to Cisco Juniper interaction look, right? So if I have my Arista routers talking to my Cisco routers, what does that start looking like? Um, so that's kind of neat too. Awesome. Yeah, highly recommend checking out. There's there's also a commercial entity around it, IntentionNet. If you guys are starting to Google around, IntentionNet is the kind of the commercial side. Of Batfish, but prim the primary Batfish product is an open source project. Um, so, so here's this ABD piece that we've talked about a few times, and some of the major components here, because ABD is kind of a big, broad collection of uh, Ansible work that we've done. And there's a lot of pieces here. Big shout out to the ABD team at Arista. These guys work really hard and do an amazing job when it comes to building this stuff. Um, so, part of it is having you know a well defined. We're running tests and stuff against ABD as well. So we're treating these Ansible collections like we would a piece of software. So we've got integration tests and, and continuous integration within the AVD uh, development cycle itself. So you see that's where we're using these Docker containers to do that. This is where we're using Molecule uh, within GitHub and, um, and Ansible to test out things as new changes happen to the AVD templates. Uh, it leverages Ansible CVP, which we saw in the demo, is how we then get from these AVD templates and generated configs into Cloud Vision. Uh, and then it's also kind of a community effort. We have customers, we have other folks who have been contributing to AVD, helping us develop these best practices. It's something we really want to encourage. We really want to have, you know, as much participation from the, from the overall community as possible. Help us make these things better. Help us uh, continuously improve these. And one of the big pieces uh, that AVD provides is, again, we're not dealing with device level configs necessarily anymore, right? I can actually deal with higher level fabric, fabric abstractions. I can say, this is the subnet that I've allocated to my L3 eVPN, or you know, this is the, um, these are the services that I wanna run on my network. And so you see that as we work through, if you actually go through and look at how AVD works, it goes from this fabric abstraction layer, which we call EOS designs, where we take in various variables and various uh, YAML files and stuff, where I can define these things kind of network wide, it'll then crunch that down into these structured configs, which give me kind of a YAML output of what these configs look like from a data modeling standpoint, and then crunch that down one more time with the CLI config gen to actual those CLI rendered uh, text files that you saw, which would then get pushed to the device. So, so it's a couple layers of abstraction, but I think it's a, it's built in such a way that it allows you not to necessarily have to go touching every individual switch unless there's something you you want to do on a specific switch. So a very powerful um, Ansible playbook or collection that we've we've developed here with the team. Uh, when it comes to data transformation, which I've kind of talked about in a, a minute ago, uh, what we're seeing here, this is kind of the direction we want to head where we see these network fabric inputs and there's lots of different ways I can take those data models, if you will, and then translate those into the device config on the other side, right? So the, the direction we're heading, and this is a little bit forward leaning, is I can take that same AVD model, I can punch it into YAML, feed it through, let's say, Jinja 2, and then feed it through Ansible and end up with the device config on the far right. Or I could take that same kind of data model, feed it into the Cloud Vision API, or use the Cloud Vision GUI that you saw a minute ago with Studios. Again, feed that into a template so Cloud Vision can take in Jinja 2 or Mako templates and then crunch out the device config on this. So the same result, just different paths, but the key here is to have a common input, right? To have the common data model on the far left that allows me to work through the same workflow, no matter which path I wanna take 
uh, to actually generate those configs. So, so Fred, on, on this one, for something like Cloud Vision, where you're going to do a networking book for Cloud Vision, but you still want to, you still can have the workflow go through and do Batfish, do the validation, do the testing, all the other components are in there. So I, that to me makes sense, especially for the config side. What are you guys doing around the policy side in terms of like how you think about like policy and policy enforcement and how that happens? Is that is that tied in, in the same way? Because I really see that as something that really Cloud Vision is going to be focused on versus like, you know, any of the open source tooling sets. I mean, it's it's too hard to sort of integrate cross platform that way. And so it probably makes more sense for partners and vendors to integrate the Cloud Vision and Cloud Vision portal than it does to anything else. But, you know, what's what's the vision? What's going on there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of angles to that. Um, let me back up a couple of slides real quick. Um, so one thing I, I kind of glossed over here because it's, sometimes we get lost in the weeds. Uh, if you look at that pre-deployment testing, one other aspect we've been investigating is using OPA, which is the po Open Policy Agent. For those right. folks who aren't familiar with that, that's actually more, more popular in the cloud native space, like the Kubernetes guys and, and that stuff use it to define policies when it comes to my services. So, so to give you an example, if I'm deploying this new service in Kubernetes, I could say, well, if it's a public facing service, um, I should lock down that it only can be, you know, use HTTPS to reach it. And you can kind of define in a very open language what the policy should be for that given service. And so what we've looked at or we're looking at is applying that to the network as well. So uh, what I could say is, well, I should have a network wide policy that you should not have Telnet enabled on any network device, right? I mean, this is, we, we've had SSH for long enough now. I think we don't need Telnet anymore. So. I can define these network wide policies and then I can push that into this CI pipeline. So it again does validation testing and make sure that those policies are being adhered to. Now, OPA, all it's really doing is generating kind of the rule set and the um, kind of the policy language, if you will. But to your point, that's where Cloud Vision can come in and make sure those policies are actually adhered to. So Cloud Vision can then query the network database that it has of all the switches and say, yes, this policy is being uh, is being applied or is not being applied and kind of do, right. do more of a- Because because part of the challenge with OPA, right, is, is knowing where to actually apply, right? I, I'm assuming yes. Cloud Vision is coming in to help with that part of it versus versus other areas. Because there's nothing, there's no other open source, at least that I'm not familiar with any other open source tooling set that, that helps you to figure out that side of the equation, at least today. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we're looking at OPA as kind of a policy language, if you will, just to give you the framework to define that policy and the language to define that policy. And then we'll build in things to Cloud Vision to allow you to enforce uh, that policy. All right. So um, some new things that we've been kind of developing actually in conjunction with the uh, Network to Code team. So hat tip to those guys. Uh, one thing is some chat off integration. And I don't think this is super new to folks, but it's, it's kind of neat. Um, so we've got this, this Slack integration, or actually it's Slack or MS Teams integration uh, to Cloud Vision. Um, some screenshots here, I could also show you a demo video, but it might not be necessary. Uh, so it allows you to then query Slack and pull information out of Cloud Vision. So in this case here, I'm saying, you know, Cloud Vision, give me the device config for one of my spine switches. And then it spits it all out to you here um, in the Slack window. And then in this case, uh, Cloud Vision, show me all the CVEs that are open up against one of my devices. So this is kind of cool. I can you know, very quickly and easily query what CVEs are, are currently affecting my, my switches in my network. And what I think, I mean, aside from just being a neat demo, um, I think where this becomes powerful is again, to that team collaboration aspect of things, right? How can I take this data? How can I share it with my team? If we're trying to troubleshoot something, if we're trying to kind of get our heads around something as a team, allowing us to integrate this data from Cloud Vision and push it into my collaboration tools like Slack allows my teams to better, more effectively communicate, not even within just the network team, but also across to the platform teams and the services team and, and whomever else might be using, uh, using things and we're trying to, trying to work together on solving issues. Um, another piece here is this Nautobot tag sync. And so back to the idea of having that source of truth and again, it could be either guy as the source of truth, but uh, making sure we have one place to be the source of truth is how do I synchronize data between what Cloud Vision has and what Nautobot has. So Cloud Vision makes extensive use of tags when it comes to the devices, um, you know, being able to define what is a leaf or spine and all these other kinds of things. Uh, but Nautobot also has a very powerful tagging system. So why don't we want to, I mean, we want to keep those two things in sync. If th something is in, you know, rack five, I want to make sure that both both sides agree that this thing is on rack five. Uh, so what we're going to do here 
is we've built this, this synchronization tool, which allows you to install this in the Nautobot and then go to, uh, go to the kind of this web page and I can sync. So I can choose which one I want to be the source authority. I either take my tags from Nautobot, sync them into Cloud Vision, and I can just, you know, cron job this and run it whenever, or flip it around. And I say, I want, I want, you know, Nautobot to be the source of truth. And uh, I, maybe I said that backwards, but you know, you get the idea. One, one side or the other can be the source of truth when it comes to these tags and the other side syncs from it. And we see this as kind of a foundational kind of building block piece uh, to building bigger automation. So again, this is us just kind of starting the ball rolling, getting things moving with these tools. And to the earlier point, we want to make your experience with Arista and these open source tools the best that we can make it so that you're not locked into using Arista tooling, but you're going to prefer it because we're just going to have cooler and better integrations when it comes to using um, these open source products. Um, one other thing I'm going to kind of announce here is we're, we're going to build up this new, or we're built, we've built up this new Slack workspace uh, for collaborating on DevOps, uh, specifically with Arista and the Arista team, the guys who do the ABD work, myself, Doug, uh, all the folks involved here. Uh, all of you delegates, I sent an invite to you probably about an hour ago, um, if you opted in. So if you if I had your email address, I, I, I blasted it out to you about an hour ago. So you guys um, all have an invite to this. Uh, any customers out or anybody out there who's watching who wants um, an invite, let your sales team know, your Arista team know, and, and we can get you an invite. Right now, we're kind of keeping it limited beta-ish because we're still kind of figuring ourselves out around this. But I, I think it could be a really interesting space for us to be able to work with customers and, and talk with folks about you know, their DevOps journeys, their tools, their best practices, and, and fold that back into what we're doing and what we're promoting as, uh, as Arista. And then finally, what I'll leave you with is a bunch of links. Uh, and, and this is just kind of more for reference than anything. So, you know, some of the examples we've posted to GitHub, you see there, uh, we have a YouTube playlist that myself and some of the other SCs uh, at Arista have been building up with, with regards to NetDevOps as well as Doug. Um, so some just examples, some, some other tools that we've shown. Um, Ansible ABD and Ansible CVP, the two big Ansible collections that we highlighted here. Uh, they both have their own pages that you can go to for reference. Cloud Vision's APIs, the two um, the two co-developed tools with Nautobot, both the Tag Sync and Chatbot, those are both posted to GitHub under the Nautobot repository. So we worked again with those guys and it's posted actually in the Nautobot repositories there. And then this last one's kind of a personal plug. We have this uh, open management page where we're putting out a lot of interesting and I think pretty good examples about how using GNMI, gRPC, OpenConfig and all that stuff uh, so just a bunch of kind of open source management tools. How do you use them? How do you make them work well with Arista and, and in general? Uh, so it's a pretty nice site that I think we've got going there. Can I, can um, I ask any... a question? Yes, please. Uh, so I see a pretty impressive uh, CI CD uh, pipeline. And uh, I was wondering uh, if uh, it's limited to only Arista environment where the devices are Arista or you plan to extend it to uh, other vendors to, uh, if the devices are, you know, not non arrest time. Yeah, I mean, to, to the kind of the, the, the earlier point, we've chosen open source multi-vendor tools as far as possible when possible. So if you actually go back, I mean, I can go back here and look, um, you know, if you look at the tool sets that I've, we've got here along the way, there's really nothing Arista until you get to the far right of this slide where you're hit, hitting, how do I deploy this to my actual device? So everything else along that way, you could make that work with any other networking vendor you want. Um, again, what we want to do is give you a really clean and easy way to make that work with Arista. So when you get to the Arista side of this, it's going to work super well. Uh, and then, you know, kind of up to, to, to everybody else to, to follow suit when it comes to their, their integrations. Okay, thank you. Sure.